It's time to learn some more equilibrium. I'm Jeremy Krug, and welcome back to AP Chemistry, General Chemistry, and we're going to be learning some applications of equilibrium constants in this video. There are three big ones that we're going to be learning about in this video. By the way, if you find my videos useful, if you'll be so kind as to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe if you haven't done so already so that uh, uh, YouTube will share uh, my videos with other chemistry students who'd like to, uh, to learn some chemistry as well, so learn some equilibrium. Well, the first application that we're going to learn about is something called the reaction quotient. We're going to see if you have a mixture that's not at equilibrium and find out is it going to go to the right and make more uh, products or is it going to go to the left and make more reactants. Well, let's find out how to do that. So here we have a flask that contains 0.4 molar nitrogen gas, 0.50 molar hydrogen gas, and 0.3 molar ammonia gas at 500 degrees Celsius. And they're going to react according to that equation. And there's the Kc value for that. So the question is, is the mixture at equilibrium? And if not, in which direction is that mixture going to proceed? Well, we're going to have to calculate the Q, the reaction quotient for this. Now, the reaction quotient is determined in exactly the same way as the equilibrium constant is determined. It's products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient. So if you know how to write an equilibrium constant expression, which you should at this point, uh, you can write a Q value as well. So we're just going to plug that in there. So we have the, you know, the, the NH3 squared, because there's a 2 right there, over N2 concentration times H2 and the cube, of course, because of the 3 of the coefficient. So we're just going to plug these in. So on the numerator, NH3 is 0 0.30, so that goes in in the numerator, and that's squared, over nitrogen, which is 0 0.40 molar, and then hydrogen, we're going to have to cube that, is 0 0.50 molar. So when you calculate the arithmetic here, you'll find that the value for Q is about 1.8. So Q is not equal to K, is it? So that means it's not at equilibrium. Well, in which direction is it going to proceed? Well, here are the choices. If Q equals K, that means we're at equilibrium. If Q is less than K, it's going to go to the right. And if Q is greater than K, it's going to go to the left. Well, Q is greater than K, isn't it? 1.8 is larger than 0.18, so it's going to go to the left. Now, if you have trouble re remembering that, then what I do, you know, Q is greater than K, and so you can think of that little greater than or less than sign as like a little a bird, and as you can see, its beak is going toward the left. And so that's the side that it's going to eat. It's going to eat the left side. So it's going to go toward the left side, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so let's try another example. We have a different reaction here. And actually, it's the same reaction. We have a 2-liter flask that contains 0.96 moles of nitrogen, 0.96 moles of hydrogen, and 0.1 moles of ammonia gas at 500 degrees Celsius. And they're going to react the same to that equation. we got the same Kc value. As it reacts, which substances increase and which ones will decrease? So, once again, we're going to plug these into our uh, reaction quotient expression, our expression for Q. That's products over reactants raised the power of the coefficient. So it's, it's basically like it was for K. And now we're going to plug the numbers in. So NH3, well, let's see here. NH3, we have to actually calculate the molarity, right? So it's 0.1 moles divided by 2 liters, you know, moles per liter. So that's 0.05 moles, and that's squared. Over nitrogen, well, 0.96 moles divided by 2 liters gets us 0.48. And the mole value for uh, hydrogen is the same, so we put that, but this time we have to cube it, since there's a 3 here. So now we calculate the Q, and it looks like our value for the reaction quotient is 0.047. So is Q greater than K or is Q less than K? I hope you can see that Q is less than K, isn't it? 0.047 is much smaller or quite a bit smaller than 0.18. So Q is less than K. So that means it's going to go to the right. 
Okay, so we're going to be making more products. So if the reaction is shifted to the right, that means that we're going to make more ammonia, aren't we? So ammonia is going to increase, and that increase happens at the expense of nitrogen and hydrogen. So that means that those reactants are going to decrease. And so that's how you work a problem with a reaction quotient. We'll, we'll find that this actually is applied to some other things in, e in equilibrium later on. Let's look at another application of an equilibrium constant. We can actually manipulate the chemical reaction and find out what the new equilibrium constant is going to be. So here's this same reaction that we had in the last two examples. If I wanted to find out what's the equilibrium constant of the reverse of that. So I've just flipped the reaction around. You know, the reactants and the products are just flipped. Well, I think we can understand what's going to happen here, right? If we're writing out the equilibrium constant expression, that means that the things that were on the numerator are now in the denominator, and the things that were in the denominator are now in the numerator. So it's the, the reciprocal, isn't it? So we just have to take the reciprocal of the old equilibrium constant, and you can find what that's equal to. So it's about 5.6 in this case. Now here's another thing that you may have to do. Uh, let's say that we have these two individual reactions. The first one, the first reaction has an equilibrium constant of 51.8, and the second reaction has an equilibrium constant of 1.21 times 10 to the minus 3. Can we find the value of Kc for this other reaction? Well, we might notice that as we look at those reactions closely, the first reaction and the second reaction actually add up to get you the third reaction. You, know, you can cancel out the, the carbons on both sides and cancel out the methane molecules on both sides and start to see that they add up to get you the, you know, the, the, the third reaction. This sounds kind of like Hess's law back from thermodynamics, doesn't it, if you uh, followed my videos back then. Well, instead of adding up the Kc values, we're going to multiply them by each other. So we have to times them, and so we find that the new equilibrium constant is 0.0627 for the new one. So this is kind of like, kind of like Hess's law for equilibrium constants, except instead of adding the values, we have to multiply them by each other. So that's the second application of the equilibrium constant. We can uh, manipulate these reactions and find out what the new equilibrium constant is going to be. Here's a third uh, and final application of equilibrium constants in this, in this video at least. And that's how equilibrium relates to thermodynamics, our favorite topic, right? Uh, an equilibrium constant can tell us what the delta G value of a reaction is going to be and if it's going to be a thermodynamically favored process or a TFP at that temperature. And here's the reaction that, or the equation we're going to use for that. Delta G equals negative RT natural log of K. So delta G is the same thing it was before. It's the change in Gibbs free energy. If you have a negative value for delta G, that means that it is thermodynamically favored. If it's positive, that means it's not thermodynamically favored and the reaction is probably not going to happen at that temperature. The R is the universal gas constant. Now, don't be alarmed here because the number is different than it was in the last series of lessons. And that's because we've changed the units. Okay, In the previous lesson it was 0.0821, but that's because we had liters and atmospheres. Well here we have joules because we're trying to calculate delta G in joules. So it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin whenever we're looking at it in uh, terms of joules. So use that value for R. T is still temperature in kelvins. Nothing too unusual about that. And K, of course, is your equilibrium constant. We have to take the natural log of that. So you'll need to be familiar with your natural log button on your calculator to solve these problems. So let's take this same reaction that we've been uh, kind of using over and over again here, and let's calculate the value of delta G for this reaction at 500 degrees Celsius. So we're going to use that same reaction, or that same equation, like I said there, and we're going to solve for delta G this time. So we're going to uh, solve for that. And what is the value for R? Well, it's uh, almost said it, and it's 
8.314. So we're going to have negative 8.314 in there. The temperature is 500 degrees Celsius, but of course convert it to Kelvin, so that's 773. And the equilibrium constant is 0.18, but we have to take the natural log of that. So it's going to be negative 1.715 when you key that into your calculator. And now when we multiply these values across, we solve for delta G, and we find that delta G is 11,000 joules per mole. And we normally like to put this in kilojoules, so that's positive 11 kilojoules per mole. So that's the value of delta G. So it wasn't too hard, was it? Just do that math. Now, is this thermodynamically favored at this temperature? Well, look at the sign. If delta G is positive, is it a TFP? Is it thermodynamically favored? That would be a no, wouldn't it? Since it's positive, it's not thermodynamically favored. The delta G would have to be negative in order for it to be a thermodynamically favored process at that temperature. I hope you uh, learned about these three applications of equilibrium constants. Being able to find a reaction quotient and find a Q versus K, being able to manipulate a, a reaction and find the new value of K, and then finding delta G for a reaction if you know the equilibrium constant and vice versa too. If you learned something from my video, please uh, smash that thumbs up button if you'd be so kind as to do so. Like I said, my name is Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for over two uh, decades and I want you to get the highest score that you can in your chemistry class and make a five on that AP Chemistry exam if that's what your goal is to do. Join me again on my videos in the future as we journey through equilibrium and through chemistry and we can learn some more chemistry together.